Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and I'm about to say about the least controversial thing you can say in gardening, bees are important. And this isn't just for you veggie guys and fruit guys where the pollination will determine your yield, but also for the reproductive health of everything in the garden. That cross-pollination allows for diverse offspring and the health of the populations of the plants. But what is the right thing, the best thing to plant to support the health of your bees in your neighborhood? And that of course may vary a little bit by your climate and region, but if you ask me off the top of my head to name a few that I love for bees, I'm going to do that for you right now. First of all, Nifo red hot poker, I'll put a picture up of this, tons of nectar and that's what's true of all of the plants on this list, pollen or nectar to support the bees. Next one on the list I would say is butterfly weed, even though it's named for butterflies, is excellent for bees. Third one on the list, penstemon. Love the penstemon's beard tongue is its common name and again bees go crazy for it in the garden. You'll never find it without bees in the garden. Uh, cosmos, it's a classic daisy but again favored by bees. Um, and finally I'm going to say borage. And borage is the plant where I plant it, has blue flowers and it is the most likely to always have bees on it in the garden. And when I say all of this and I'm picking some of my favorites, it's actually defeating the purpose a little bit because I have to say it isn't about finding the one perfect plant for bees, but rather by choosing a bunch of different plants that the bees can visit throughout the year. So you fill in all those gaps of flowering in your garden. For instance, in the borage family, and I'm going to say that, go back to that picture of the borage, in the borage family there are some early flowering relatives that I can show you are blooming in my garden right now. Things like uh, Pulmonaria is out there and Brunnera is out there as well. I'll show the pictures of those. So it will fill up those gaps in your garden. Now here I'm saying all of these things that are good for bees, but I just watched a video recently by another local uh, nurseryman who said that everything I know about bees is wrong. And I thought, well, that's an intriguing title. And uh, he was good enough to agree to talk to me about the topic and show me his nursery. So uh, what follows now is a uh, tour for um, Plan B Native Plant Nursery. I'm with Josh on this, and he has a completely different point of view about what are the best things to plant for bees in your garden. Hey guys, I'm Josh. I'm the owner of Plan B Native Plants here in Langley and um, I grow exclusively native plants to BC so I'm going to show you around my area here. This is this side of my greenhouse is kind of my uh, sales area where people come in and look at plants and pick the ones out they want to buy. Um, this one here is a cool one, a very really, really popular one called uh, Henderson's Checker Mallow. It's actually blue listed which means it's kind of a species at risk in BC here. Um, you know, all these plants grow in different areas around BC. Here's one you guys might like. This is called a bald hip rose, which is a native rose species that it likes is, a lot of uh, shady areas. That's one of our natives. Uh, we also have the Nootka rose. Yeah, we got Nootka rose, and we also have um, the prickly rose, or uh, Rosa acularis. Right, and Rosa woodsii. Actually, that's one that's not on my radar. Okay, cool. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, lots of different plants here. We got uh, nodding onions and hooker's onion. We have a lot of plants with the prefix hooker, uh, and that was actually because it was a 18th century botanist that named a lot of our plants. Right, we have a, a few Douglasii as well, yeah, right? Yeah, a lot of Douglasii. Uh, oval leaf blueberry, which is actually a member of the huckleberry family. That's one of the names for it. Those are tasty. Oh yes, very tasty. Now, you, do you also have the red huckleberry? I do at times, but the all the vaccinums or the huckleberries are really popular, so they sell it pretty quickly when I have them. All right, I'm just gonna back up on your signage here because I, I wanna see that. So this is the uh, Plan B Native Plants. Now, why native plants? Why, why is the focus of your nursery uh, on that particularly? So native plants, I discovered, are really important for our insects and our wildlife. Literally everything in our ecosystem relies on these specific plants to survive. Like, Pretty much every butterfly species you have is going to have a specific plant or group of plants um, that it relies on to lay its eggs on because those are the only food the caterpillars can eat. A lot of our bees are specialists or even you can use bumblebees as well. Um, so they have like finite resources, finite plants they can access nectars from. So if honeybees are in the area and they can also access their pla those plants plus all the other ones, then they're really creating a lot of competition that can drive out the native bee species that are really at risk and the ones we really need to be protecting. So as um, you know, our urban ecosystems expand and we get rid of wild habitat, 
these plants are also going and that's why we're seeing so much decline of insects and wildlife and bees and everything. So adding these plants into our ecosystem is going to just benefit wildlife and help support more and more. That must make it difficult in certain ways, because I know the nursery business a little bit, um, in sourcing your plants. Where do you, uh, where do you get these? I mean, I, you, can't, you can't just go to most of your wholesalers and buy finished native plants. Um, I do actually have one wholesaler. I order um, some of my plants from, but a large amount of them I am growing myself. And I'm hoping as I go forward to grow in more and more of them myself and be a completely self-sufficient eventually. But many of these plants actually take years to grow from seed into a plant a phase or a spot where they are um, sellable. Right. Yeah. So if you want to get something here with flowers on it, you know, um, and large enough to fill the pot, uh, that might be a couple of seasons in the pot, right? So it's not yeah, just exactly. a quick... I mean, there's certain ones you can grow in a few months, like three months is uh, average for a lot of them, but certain ones you're looking at at least like a full season, full year, right. and you sell the next year. And do you do any of these from cuttings? Um, I've been experimenting with cuttings a little bit. None of these are from cuttings uh, that I have available currently, but um, I have some in the back I can actually show you. Here we got snowberry, we got some red elderberry over here. Yeah, elderberries are nice and easy to take from cuttings. Oh yeah, really easy. Got some uh, twinberry. And you know, I'm not a big fan of cuttings just because you're cutting down on the genetic diversity. Um, and then you have all these plants out there that have the same genetics. So if they ever get sick, then all of them are gonna die. And it kind of, it kind of um, washes down the local genetics of like, um, that are really adapted to your climate if you're putting out the same ones everywhere. Right. So I'm trying to do everything from seed, but I thought this year I was going to supplement some of my stock a little bit with these. Cool. And what do you got? The, are these lupins over here? Yeah, these ones are actually a river lupine, which is a red listed species. They're actually uh, endangered. I think there's only seven wild populations left. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and what, uh, what color are they? The blue? Yeah, they're blue. And I also have big leaf lupine, which is the much more common one here. A lot right. of those growing. And those are those are related, I think. They're one of the parent species of one of the commercial lupins. The uh, oh, the, the Russell domesticated, uh, yeah. Russell hybrid. Yes, they yeah. are. Interesting thing about Russell hybrid, though, is um, when they actually seed and reproduce, they turn back into the non-cultivar version, the big leaf lupine. Really? Yeah. yeah. So if you just if you just let them reseed in the garden, they more or less revert to the native species. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's kind of cool. Also, I, although I think a lot of uh, homeowners probably <laughs> don't appreciate the massive lupines afterwards. Okay, so if I get <laughs> if I put lupins in my garden, I have to say first thing that happens, or uh, on a predictable schedule, they will be taken over by aphids. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> that's, that's true. They, they they seem to be a, a particular magnet for aphids, but I don't go nuts on the uh, trying to eradicate the aphids. I kind of feel like um, if the lupins attract the aphids early, then they're going to, uh, they're going to also attract all those things that feed on the aphids, the, the beneficials and the, the predators, and maybe, maybe my roses will be spared. Uh, <laughs> how do you deal with pests here? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a big issue with pests because I have exactly that. I have all these different native plants that attract all these predator insects as well as like, you know, I might get aphids occasionally, but they don't generally last very long because I have all the other plants attracting the predators of the insects and the wasps that will eat the aphids and things like that. Right. So you're set up here, you, you're set up in a greenhouse and I noted that you, uh, you share this space. It's actually a larger greenhouse facility and you share it with, with other growers and you're just leasing a portion of it. That is a really clever way to get into the nursery business right? instead of uh, instead of having to buy or build your own facility just leasing a space off of another grower and just taking up some some floor space from them yeah it's definitely worked out pretty nicely for me i kind of got my start um you know i just moved into this greenhouse in the fall i kind of got my start at another smaller location of a family friend that let me kind of set up on their property um, so this was a really nice little jump from that to this um, it's a much bigger area and it works out really nicely for the rent and everything. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying some of these are gonna take years to grow, especially anything in the lily family. This is actually a uh, great camas. Okay. And this is one year old now. <laughs> <laughs> and this probably won't do much more till it's about four years. It might flower. Four okay. to seven years is when you'll get your first flower from them. It's growing in a tray of water. Is that on purpose or is that? That is on purpose. They like okay. very, uh, 
wet spring conditions and dry summers. That's just part of their ecosystem, uh, the Gary Oak ecosystem and how it works generally. Right, so th the wet, they're not rotting. No, they're not water rotting. That's okay. actually what they prefer. Chemis is one of our natives that does have cultivated cultivars, like has, has available. You can go to the bare root distributors and buy a chemis. Uh, it would be different than this. But again, your, one of your reasons is maintaining uh, ecological diversity. You don't want to just go, okay, I'm going to get commercially cultivated one variety of chemis. It's, it's to, uh, to have the whole diversity going on. Yeah, you because you really want the native genetics because when you have a cultivar, you're changing the genetics. And you know, sometimes it's not that bad, but sometimes it can change things like, you know, just something as simple as the taste of the plant might be unappealing to the insects that would naturally depend on it. Or um or a lot of times, you know, you'll find cultivars that are um are sterile and don't produce nectar or pollen or they can't reproduce things like that. Right. Or, you know, even like things like the change of color can also be, um, can affect how insects will see them and how they'll feed on them. Like, yeah. uh, if you change the color, a bee might not even recognize that as something appealing to it. And what is this? This is a, is These that, are, is that uh, miner's lettuce? Yeah, or? that's miner's lettuce there. Well, that's kind of cool and uh, edible. Yeah, and edible. Uh, these ones are also miner's lettuce, but these ones are uh, Siberian miner's lettuce. You have, uh, looks like seeding trays. Yes, trays of a lot of stuff. I stored a lot of my stuff in these trays. Um, you know, this year I've stored a lot of things just directly in one gallon pots as well, like uh, some of the shrubs and trees that are going to grow to that size, because um, it cuts down on the time overall. For sure. And I see you're probably just starting these at natural temperatures, right? I mean, well, you're in a greenhouse, but you're not you're not doing heated benches. You're not doing any kind of uh, germination chamber or anything like that. This is just, you know, straight up letting nature do its thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I can't beat nature. These plants don't have like all these specific things going for them outside when they're germinating and doing their thing in nature. So uh, I just try to keep it as natural as I can. I actually plant mo pretty much all of my seeds in the fall and I just leave them with the greenhouse door open so they can get that uh, cold air and breeze in over the winter. What would be your, um, your uh, pitch to an average gardener um, who you know, wants to be able to use, uh, let's say all the colors of the palette, they wanna be able to use uh, native plants, they wanna be able to use exotic plants. Is it just a matter of you know, spare some space in your garden for some of the natives? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with using some of the cultivars and other species too, but it's just all about balance, right? Um, you know, try to add some of the native plants into your garden as well, and you know, you're probably going to find that's going to help you keep a uh, problem insects like aphids down as well. All right, that's the end of the tour, and thank you so much for watching. I hope you found that informative. It truly is one of my great pleasures in life to find people who have different points of view than me and that I can learn something from by listening to them. So it was a pleasure for me to visit that. I may not come away vowing to only grow native plants, but I don't think that's what he's asking anyway. He just wants to make some room in my garden and I can do that. All right, thanks for watching. And if you have any other questions uh, or comments about the best plants for bees, please drop those into the comments below the video.